Welcome to a psychiatrist's take on the Bible. This podcast does not provide psychiatric, medical, or professional advice, opinion, treatment, or counseling. It contains general information for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for psychiatric, medical, or professional care. It does offer a unique, so what, take on the Bible of a board-certified psychiatrist who is also an ordained minister. Last night at church, they had a gathering of the old people, 55 and older. Well, if that's the definition of old, I'm deep into that one, coming up on my 69th. Praise God for that. Well, are there any special attitudes that we elders should have about getting older? Or even if you're not an elder, you will be, by God's grace. As I get older on the outside, I try to be younger on the inside, sometimes totally embarrassing my poor grandchildren. I often get fairly demonstrative when we're singing and and act out the words of the hymn by raising my hands. So I was helping my young grandson, oh, he's about six, and to raise his hands, and he was quite mortified. So maybe I'm younger than he is. Of course, there's always time for him to become young. Being aware of the brevity of life, I find this strong urge to look at how I invest my time. And will it count for eternity? Am I investing in people? And am I thinking of the future? For shortly I shall pass off this scene, and my grandkids will be there in a different world than the one I had to do battle in. Will they be ready? Is there anything I can do to help them prepare? So, I've been putting more effort into the Internet, and I feel that God is guiding me on that. I hope you notice that I've been doing these podcasts a little more, and boy, has the devil been fighting me on that one. Oh, all that technology. And uh, a couple of times I tried to upload, and it just wouldn't go, but it seems to be working now, and I'm very grateful. My wife, Lois, is going to find ways to get my blog known on a wider scale. There are a lot of people out there uh, helping folks with God's truth. And I'd like them to at least link people into mind for those who would find that helpful. And God has led a couple of my friends to start a Facebook group. And I'm not entirely sure what that means, but my wife is on a Facebook group for her diabetes. um, And it's like a slow motion conversation and that gets information out that people need and answers questions people have. So I'm excited about that. And, of course, I have to find time to try to take my information and make it more available and more practical. So pray for me as we hope to launch that in May. When Hezekiah was getting old, God came to him and said, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Well, silly man started whining about it. And as the prophet was leaving, God said to him, Okay, okay, go back and tell Hezekiah, quit whining and I'll give you another 15 years. But he had said, set your house in order. Really, he was just giving him more time to do that, and he didn't. He had a son, Manasseh, who took over when he died 15 years later. Evil man, evil man. You can read it if you want. He's so evil, just telling you what he did is uh, disgusting. But maybe if he had either picked a different successor or worked during those 15 years to get Manasseh to learn to love God as he did. Instead, he just sort of coasted. He allowed some visitors from distant Babylon to see all the wealth that God had allowed him to accumulate. So they promptly went home and 
After his death, they came back with an army and conquered the place to get all that that they had seen. He didn't ask God if that was a wise thing to do. And instead of preparing the people for the fact that God was ready to bring judgment down on them and they should repent in sackcloth and ashes, he said, well, as long as the war doesn't come until after I'm dead, fine with me. And we need to have a very different attitude. If God gives you 15 more years, 50 more years, or five more years, that's his business. We need to grab the years in front of us, living in the now with passion and peace, yet being constantly okay with moving on whenever God calls. As Paul says, I am in a straight between two things, having a desire to depart me with the Lord. But for now, staying and ministering to others is even better. That should be our attitude. We should be driven in the present with awareness of the first day when we found the Lord and the day of the Lord that lies ahead. And in between, we're in the day of now. Grab it and minister to others. Because Hezekiah was not ready to go, he was not ready to stay. Think about that. There was a foolish young protester a few years ago in Washington who held up a, a sign that said, There is nothing worth dying for. And the whole nation gasped. Is that what we're coming to? If there is nothing worth dying for, then there's nothing worth living for. And if you're so into dying and going being with God, then there's nothing worth living for. Because what makes life worth living is to see it as precious opportunity to take the gospel of peace and share it with others. We're okay, but they aren't. To have a clear burden for those around us. Unlike Hezekiah, we need to invest whatever the time we have left in leaving a legacy and in calling our country to repent, lest we in the United States reap a consequence far worse than the invasion of Babylon, far worse perhaps even than the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. For we have known God in a deep way and then turned our back on him. But not entirely. God is still working, and we need to blow the embers in each of our churches and see the flame once more in our country, for God has been kind many times in the past to give us revival. Life focus should be like driving a car. We should learn from the past and not let it control our decisions in the present or spend all our time trying to ignore the past or bury the past. And we should look to the future to instruct what the purpose of the present is. But God wants us to be focused on the here and now. Take no thought for the morrow. God knows you need things in the future. You have enough things to deal with today. And seize the opportunities of now. Don't wallow in the accomplishments of the past. Then, being grateful for God's mercy in the past and hoping to the end for the promised blessings, we seize the moment doing everything with all our might as unto the Lord and not as men-pleasers. Grateful for every second he gives us on this earth to fight the good fight and equip the next generation to continue that war. I think of the Israelis in the desert who whined about the consequences they'd pulled on their own heads. What if... What if they'd spent the 40 years before they died in the wilderness teaching their children to be godly warriors? What a difference it would have made. Instead, their children went into the promised land and didn't trust God, didn't finish the job, and carried idols with them. I see so many old people who seem to have the attitude, well, I've done my part, so now I'll sit back and coast. I tell you one thing. God has made sure that I don't care how senile you are, how weak you are, how bedridden you are. You can pray, and your prayers will make all the difference. At least we need to start there. I remember a friend whose wife was getting a bad case of Alzheimer's. But as we would sit around in a circle and pray, we would give her a stack of 3 by 5 cards with prayer requests on, and she could read them and prayed them to the Lord. Of course, then her memory of it would slip. But she knew what we were doing, and she could read the cards. 
and I know God listened and blessed her faith and ours for drawing her into the circle. So, the young need us to be good to the last drop. Our witness of what God has done and is doing and how to go to distance. And often this generation doesn't seem to know that they need us, but they do. So, don't get mad at them. Get involved. May God richly bless you. Thank you.